que está a cargo del doctor Fabián Ambrís Vargas. Le voy a dar una pequeña introducción y después nos va a dar su práctica. Entonces, el doctor Fabián Ambrís estudió la licenciatura en Ciencias e Ingeniería de los Materiales en el Posteriormente, realizó la maestría en Ciencias de los Materiales en la misma institución. Fue pues el ordeno de ECA para realizar el doctorado en Ciencias de la Energía y los Materiales en el Instituto Nacional de la Recherche e Instituto Marianas, Canadá. Una vez culminado su doctorado, realizó dos años de estancia postdoctoral en el Centro de Investigación de Plasma de la Universidad de Concordia en Montreal, Canadá. Desde junio, eh, bueno, este es el 2 de 2010. Bueno, es investigador del área de almacenamiento de energía del CIO y es miembro, no, es, es miembro del Sistema Nacional de Investigadores y de Lula. Las áreas de, de interés del doctor Fabián son ciencias de los materiales con especial interés en el estudio de la naturaleza física de los mismos, así como su diseño y métodos que permiten aplicaciones tecnológicas. El doctor Ambris ha publicado el cinema artículos de investigación y es inventor de un procedimiento de deposición de evaporación para fabricar memorias semiconductoras. Pues muchísimas gracias, doctor Fabián, por aceptar nuestra invitación y por favor, ustedes vemos. So, first I would like to say thanks to everybody for attending this presentation. Thanks for accepting my for accepting me to participate in this seminar. And the talk of today is Advanced Manufacturing Process of a Lithium Ion Battery Cathode. This is the, the title of this presentation. As an outline, in this uh, this presentation it will be discussed uh, the, the optimization of the value frequency management parameters in order to produce a type of material. This is the essential component of a lithium-ion battery. So let's start with the introduction, just a little bit of, of history. The lithium-ion battery technology, it is basically the are devices that use, that, that use chemical reactions you can see there in the screen to produce electrical energy. The emergence of this technology took place in the 80s at the University of, of Oxford as well as the University of Texas. Thanks to the research uh, um, advances and development of the of, of Professor John Goodenough. Actually, he received in 2019 as Everybody knows the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Professor John Goodenough, uh, one of his of his main discoveries, it is that he found the cathode oxide materials based on lithium. Thanks to this invention, companies such as such as Sony Company, they started to commercialize lithium-ion batteries at the beginning. Of the, of the 90s. Since then, human civilization has experienced in total up to now three decades of battery revolutions, where we have been using the batteries to energize the small electrical devices, and now then we are trying to energize um, automobiles. In terms of environmental sustainability, the scientific community is nowadays trying to find a way to, to combine the lithium-ion battery technology and the renewable energy technology. While in parallel, both the government and the automobile companies, they are, promote, they are promoting the establishment of lithium-ion battery technology to power up the global fleet of automobiles, with the aim to reduce the emission of greenhouse, greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. 
The, the structure of a battery is constituted mainly of four, uh, of four components. We have a cathode, which is a thick film deposited in aluminum. We have also the anode, it is also a thick film deposited on a copper foil. In the middle, between the cathode and the anode, there is a, a polymer, which is called the separator. Both cathode and the anode, they are electrically connected by an external circuit. Every component inside of the battery, cathode, anode, the separator, they are immersed inside of an electrolyte. In terms of materials, the cathode, it is, it is based on a, on a lithium oxide compound, and the anode it is based on a lithium graphite. These two internal components, cathode and the anode, they are the responsible to bring chargers into the battery, and the chargers, they are used either to store energy or to release the energy. In terms of the materials of the separator, it is made of a polymer, so be more specific, of a microporous polyolefin membrane. This polymer has a porosity around 40%, a, por a pore size around 30 microns, and the function of the separator it is to prevent the physical contact between the anode and the cathode. And in that way we can, pre we can prevent the formation of internal circuits inside of the battery. Also, another function of the, of the separator is to allow the, the, the ion diffusion of the lithium between the anode and the cathode. The last component it is the electrolyte, so at the commercial level, it is used lithium hexafluorosulfate. This is a conductive solution, for the reason it is presented in this blue color. And this is the medium that allows the free movement of the lithium cations between the cathode and the anode. Now, we have, as you can see, we have four different components, and among all these four different components, the cathode, this is the responsible inside of the battery to define the battery energy density and the battery cost. At the commercial level, nowadays, there are three different kinds of cathode materials. So we have the, the lithium cobalt lateral materials. We, we have also spinel, lithium manganese materials, and also polyamine materials such as the lithium iron phosphate. Let's see them in, uh, let's see these uh, three materials in, in a closer way. For example, the, the lithium cobalt. This material has an outstanding properties. What is the meaning of that? It has a high working voltage. It means that it can reach 3.9 volts, and it has high energy specific, high energy uh, capacity, it's, which is around 150 mA per hour per gram. These properties make of the lithium cobalt cake the most used cathode material in the world nowadays. However, it has several disadvantages. One of, one of these disadvantages it is related to the presence of cobalt in this cathode material. This value is representing the total amount of cobalt in the planet. This amount it is very small and therefore, it is telling us that there is a small quantity of cobalt in the planet. And this fact makes the lithium cobalt tape an expensive material. And on top of that, the, the cobalt itself, it, is, it has a bad chemical stability. Therefore, it is toxic for humans. So, so nowadays, the electronic industry is trying to find out the replacement of this lithium cobalt tape cathode. A candidate to replace the lithium cobalt tape is the lithium ion phosphate material. It also has an outstanding properties. A high working voltage, 3.4 volts. You notice this is smaller than the lithium cobalt tape. 
but it has a similar uh, energy capacity, 150 minutes per hour in one gram. The advantage of the lithium iron phosphate it is that it is based on iron and phosphor. If we compare the quantity iron phosphor versus cobalt, we can see here the values there is more iron, more phosphor on the planet. They are abundant materials. And this fact makes the lithium iron phosphate the cheapest status material among the three different classes. Another advantage of the lithium iron phosphate it is that it is not not toxic as, as lithium cobalt. In terms of battery manufacturing process, that it is used here to fabricate the, to fabricate the batteries in the electronic industry or in the automobile industry, it is divided into three different steps. So first it is prepared the electrodes, the cathode and the anodes. Once are prepared the MS cathode and nanos, they will be um, they will be embedded in the body of the battery via the cell assembly process. All the internal components in the, in the, of the battery during the cell assembly process will be inserted inside of the battery case. It will be filled with an electrolyte, and finally it will be sealed. Once the battery is sealed. The next step is the electrochemistry activation of the battery. In this case, the battery is discharged and discharged several times, all the batteries that are in the market. The idea here it is that the industry is looking for some failures that could occur during the electro preparation or cell assembly. So they are looking for internal circuits, they are looking for the, for the electrolyte leak, um, leakage, Etc. And regarding the, the manufacturing process of the electrodes, again at the commercial level, it has to pass through a series of different steps. For example, first it is, it is needed to prepare a solution or a slurry. Here the active material, which is the cathode, in form will be combined with other components, chemical components such as solvents, binders. Etc. Once it is obtained and homogenized the slurry, it will go through, through the electro deposition. Here the slurry, it will be sprayed onto, um, onto a, a metal foil. Once we have the deposition of the slurry onto the foil, we have to do the, the drying process and after the calendaring process. In the calendaring process, the tin film, it will be compacted, as we can see here, by two rollers. So the idea is to reduce the porosity concentration inside of the cathode and also to reduce the well to have an, an, a, a uniform thickness. So the problem with this manufacturing process it is that the active material, this is the, the lithium ion phosphate, it has to be in physical contact with solvents with binders and also with the rollers. The, the, the problem with that it is that it, they will contaminate the chemical composition of the, of the cathode. And therefore, if the, if the cathode is contaminated, it will affect the, the battery performance. Another problem with that manufacturing process it is that it is not compatible with the onboard micro battery technology. If, that is, if they are not compatible, it will not be possible to produce micro batteries. The micro batteries that they are desired in order to power either wireless sensors, tiny robots, etc. So, in order to, to bring closer the micro battery technology, into the market, it is necessary to change the current manufacturing process. So, by one process that it is compatible with the semiconductor industry. Therefore, it is necessary to use a physical vapor deposition technique. Nowadays, there are different 
different physical way for deposition techniques. For example, we have thermal evaporation, full laser deposition, spattering deposition. We have different deposition techniques. The sputtering, this is like the ideal candidate to be used for the production of cathodes at the commercial level. Why? Because it has several examples we can see in this, in this diagram. It, it allows the complete coverage of large surface areas. This is something that the industry wants. Also, you have control on the deposition rate. You can either produce ultra thin cathodes, thin cathodes, or thicker cathodes. And finally, the sputtering, this is compatible with the semiconductor industry. In fact, this technique is used now to use either, um, either um, the electrical contacts of a, of a transistor or a, or a capacitor inside of the silicon processors. So, regarding the state of the art of the lithium iron phosphate cathode, it has already been deposited by the sputtering. Actually, there is like, there are a lot of research articles that talks about this, the, this deposi the deposition of this material. After checking all these articles, what it was found, it was that most of the authors, they use it uh, as a substrate to grow this material, titanium foil, silver coated glass, stainless steel, silicon. The problem with those materials it is that they are not compatible or they are not being used in the current manufacturing process. Therefore, it is therefore if we want to bring closer the lithium ion battery technology, it is necessary to use a material that it is used nowadays in the industry. So in this case, this is the aluminium. Another thing that it was found on the articles, it is that the researchers, they haven't decided which parameters they have to use. For example, we can find articles with, where they use low argon deposition pressure, meaning there is a small argon quantity inside of the sputtering chamber. Some of them, they use medium deposition pressures, and others, they use high deposition pressure. The wrong selection of the argon deposition pressure it can lead to, um, to, um, to a problem in the, in the performance of the battery cathode. So here the objective of this research work it is to measure the position of lithium iron phosphate on a commercial electrode, in this case aluminum foil, by radio frequency magnetron spattering. As a second objective, we want to study, well, I'm going to, to show you what is the effect of the argon deposition pressure on the battery performance. So, regarding the experimental design, the research work, it was, the, the experimental design was divided into three different sections. First, we produced the electrode. After, it was carried out the battery assembly inside of a glow box. And finally, it was carrying out the battery evaluation. So let's go about the first step, the electro production. Here the idea it is to produce the cathode. Once we have the cathode, it will be embedded in the body of the, of, of the battery and it will be assembled in a, inside of, 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 of a glow box. And the idea is to, to, to obtain after the assembly process a battery similar to, 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 to this one, the one that we can see here in the, in the photograph. Why do we use this kind of batteries? Because basically it has the same internal components, same materials, than the batteries that are used at the commercial, at, at the commercial level. Meaning it has the same, the same components of a cylindrical battery, the one that it is used to power up the vehicles, and it has the same the same uh, structure of a prismatic battery, the one that we use to power the electronic devices. 
In the step three, once we obtain the battery, it will be evaluated using a potential set. And basically, this is our experimental design. Now let's go to the results and discussion section. Let's see what do we find. As I mentioned, our main um, object it is the, the lithium ion phosphate. It will be deposited on aluminium, and the function of this material it will provide the, the, the lithium cations, and also it will provide the, the electrons for the energy storage and for the energy release. This material it was produced by the international system. Here we can see the picture of the system. Here I'm going to explain. To how it use, how this system works. Basically, the sputtering system it is an stainless steel chamber. So for the reason we have this video, and inside of the stainless steel chamber, on the top side there is a component called the anode, and at the bottom side there is also another component which is called the cathode. On top of the cathode there is a target. So the target for this case, this is my precursor. To be more specific, this is a lithium ion phosphate target, which is the, my material that was compacted in the form of a disc, a ceramic disc, which has a diameter of 10 centimeters. So on top of the anode, it will be um, it will be attached the substrate that I mentioned. It will use aluminium foil. And at the bottom side of the chamber, there is there is a turbo pump. The turbo pump, it is um, the, its main objective it is to remove the oxygen molecules inside of the of the chamber, create a vacuum degree of around 10 centimeter. This uh, vacuum degree is similar to the one of the SEM. Sometimes, yes, only the SEM. Also, in, in the another section of this sputtering, there is this port. Via this port, it is injected a small quantity of argon gas inside of the sputtering chamber. And, and both the anode and the cathode, they are connected to a radio frequency power supply. So once it is created an electric field with this power supply, it will it is going to ionize the gas that the argon gas that it is inside. The, this argon gas it will be constituted mainly of argon cations. So if we if we see the, the plasma just one thing, we are going to see that it has a, a positive charge net. Therefore, having this positive charge net, it will not be attracted to the target, and this is something bad because we want the attraction of the plasma to the target in order to start the sputtering. So in order to generate the attraction of the plasma to the target, it is placed right behind the target a magnetron. The magnetron, it can generate a cloud of electrons on the surface of the target, and those electrons will attract the positive chargers of the plasma. And therefore, we can start with the bombardment of the surface of the target. Once we have the bombardment of the of the surface of the target, it will be generated this cloud, uh, this cloud of the species. If we look inside of these species, what we are going to find are the lithium ion phosphate atoms that are traveling from the target to the substrate. The objective it is to reach the surface of the substrate in order to build up the thin film. So basically, this is the process of the sputtering deposition. And as you, as you already noticed, there are many parameters that need to be adjusted. For example, the rotation of the, the rotation of the speed of the substrate during the, during the deposition. This is essential in order to give uniformity to the coating thickness. Another parameter that needs to be adjusted is the concentration of argon gas that it is injected inside of the, of the chamber. 
Also, the power that it is applied to, uh, to ionize the, the argon gas, the distance between the target and the substrate, and of course, the crystallization temperature of the tincture. So the wrong selection of these parameters, as we can see here in this figure, the tincture and the it will lead to several, um, several imperfections in the, in the coating. For example, we can have the presence of cracks, we can have some non-destructive phases, we can have porosity, and also no uniform thickness. All these imperfections will affect the performance of the battery. So for that reason, we have to do the optimization of the parameters. So let's, let, let's start with the optimization of the first the position parameter. So here we created different cathodes. We fixed some parameters and we just varied only one parameter in order to, to do a little science. So, so this is the box of the, the position parameters. The first parameter that was adjusted when it was fixed was the, the source power density, how, many, how much power was, up, was applied into the plus, into the gas. So here we have, this value was fixed to 2.5 watts per square centimeter. Another, another parameter that can be changed is the, the position time. In this case, we fix it to one hour in order to have enough time to build the coating. Another parameter that is the concentration of argon inside of the sputtering chamber. For this first experiment, we, we fix it to low argon deposition pressure, five millicrop. And um, another temperature, well, another parameter that can be adjusted is the crystallization temperature. So, so this is the parameter that was first optimized. So we started to, to we started to, to see which parameters switch better to crystallize the material and from 300 to 550 degrees Celsius. So once we once we uh, did the deposition of the coatings using these parameters, they were heat treated, as I already mentioned in a in a furnace, one hour at different temperatures. So 300, 400, 450, 500, or 550 degrees. So once, um, once we apply the thermal temperature from each one of these cathodes, they were wrapped into a battery, like this one. We evaluated this battery using the potential stack, and we obtained a cyclic voltage to see what happened to see the effect of the thermal annealing on the cathodes. So here we have the cyclic bulk thermogram obtained from the sample that was heat treated at 300 degrees Celsius, 400 degrees Celsius, and 500 degrees Celsius. So the three samples, they were evaluated in the same voltage range from 2.5 to 4.2 volts. So to be honest, that doesn't say much in order to see what other information can be uh, find from this course. We have to read the values on the y-axis. So, for example, for the sample that was hit with the we can we can observe that the that the sample it detected, well, that the system detected a small electrical current in the sample. That value was in the order of 0.02 microamperes. As soon as we increase the temperature of the thermal annealing process to 400, we observe an increase of the electrical current from, from 0.02 to, to 10 microamperes. This increase in electrical current it is telling us that the cathode it is becoming more conductive. For the sample that was heated at 500 degrees Celsius, the, the current value it basically increased the top. So among these three different uh, cathodes, so the one that, that has a better performance is 500 degrees Celsius. If we, we 
continue increasing the temperature, five degrees there is a drop of the electrical current. So this temperature also doesn't work. If we observe in detail this psychic voltanogram, there is a tiny picture and a tiny picture. To be to be fair, uh, these two pics could be a uh, better analysis if we, if we make a zoom and now we clear the one at two fifty four volts and at three point seventy five volts. What is the physical meaning of these two pics? Well, the first one it is it is related to the oxidation reaction, which is described by this equation. This equation it is telling us that the crystal structure of the lithium ion phosphate, when it was subjected to, an, to a voltage of 3.54 volts, in this moment it started with the release of the lithium cations and also to the electrons that allow the charge of the battery. For that reason, we observe this increase in the electrical current. Now, the other thing it is telling us that at 3.75 volts there is a the reaction described by this, by this equation. And it is telling us that at this voltage, these two species, lithium cations and electrons, they are returning back to its original place inside of the crystal structure, and therefore it will lead to the discharge of the battery. In order to understand why some coatings give us low electrical current and others give us high electrical current, we analyze the chemical composition of the surface of, this, of those materials via Raman spectro, via, uh, spectrometry. And here we have this, the Raman spectrum obtained from the coating heat treated at 300 degrees Celsius and every peak that we found, it was indexed with the letter S so those ones with the, with the blue arrows, and we use that letter because it is telling us that those peaks correspond to the substrate. So we observe the same spectrum for the coating that was heat-treated at 400 degrees Celsius, and for the coating that was heat-treated at 500 degrees Celsius, we observe something different. The shape of the spectrum it is different, and we don't have a lot of uh, peaks coming from the substrate. Now we have peaks that are coming from the from the coating, and it's telling us that at 500 degrees Celsius, we got the response of the chemical bonds of the crystal structure of the. It is telling us that 500 degrees Celsius was enough to crystalline the material. For that reason, we observe the oxidation and reduction process. 300, 400, they didn't give the right to ensure the crystallization of the material. So now, the second parameter that was optimized, um, so it was the position pressure. So in order to do the optimization of this parameter, we have to fix the other parameter. Power, it was fixed at 2.5 was per square centimeter, we fixed at the time, one hour. Now we have the experimentation temperature, it was fixed to 500 degrees Celsius. Now the parameter that was varied was the argon deposition pressure, meaning the concentration of argon inside of the sputtering chamber. So we went from low argon deposition pressures, 5 to 10 millitor, medium argon deposition pressure, 50 to 20 and high argon deposition pressure 25 to 30 per liter. So first we study the effect of the argon deposition pressure on the surface of the coating. So this is just a picture of the substrate prior deposition and after deposition we obtain these colorful coatings. So if we use the same precursor, same deposition time, why they have different colors? We got some colors for the same, for the a brownish color for the sample that were produced at low deposition pressures, 
Cream is color for the for the produced at medium and a bluish color for the ones that were produced at highest deposition pressure. The first thing that that, that came to our mind is that possible there is a thickness variation. To to validate that hypothesis, we analyze the cross section of each one of the samples using the scanning electron microscope. And uh, we obtain micrographs like this one. So the, this region corresponds to the surface, this region corresponds to the substrate, and the one um, with the arrow, it corresponds to the thickness. Again, the thickness of each one of the, of the samples that, was, that were deposited at different algal deposition pressures. Those were the, 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 the photograph that we obtained from the SCM, and from here we, cal we, est we estimated the, the thickness of each one of them. As you, as you can see, each sample has a different coating thickness. And also another thing that can be concluded from these photographs, it is that as, as we increase the argon deposition pressure, there is a decrease in the coating thickness. In that way, the, the, the sample that was produced with the lowest deposition pressure, family told it got, it got the, the, the highest uh, coating thickness. On the other case, the one with the highest deposition pressure, 30 milliliter, it got the lowest um, coating thickness. One interesting thing of the science it is to explain why we got this, this tendency. So, in order to, to, to give an explanation to that tendency, it is necessary to return to the, to the physical process of the sputtering. So, for that, here I put the diagram of the sputtering, and we use low argon deposition pressure, and also uh, the diagram when we use high deposition pressure, 13 milliliters. So what is the meaning? Low argon deposition pressure, there is low quantity of argon atoms inside of the chamber. So high argon deposition pressure, it is telling us, as we can see here, there is a high concentration of argon um, particles, argon atoms. So during the deposition, there will be the ejection of the target atoms. During the ejection of the atoms, at low argon deposition pressure, because there is low quantity of argon, it does not collide with the argon uh, atoms when the Each one, the battery performance of each one produced by expatriate. So, each one of the cathodes, they were assembled inside of the battery, they were converted into batteries, they were evaluated by the potential step, and now we obtain charge the charge force. So, energy that can be stored in one of the cathode material. So, this the charge core obtained for the sample that was produced at 5 milliliter in order to, to read or do the interpretation of this, this core. I just drew a dotted line here and, and right from the x axis we can read the maximum energy that this material can, uh, let's say, uh, can store. So if we with the value, we can, this material has a specific capacity of 30 milliampere hour in just one gram. 
So the discharge corpus is telling us that we have the oxidation reaction, and the discharge corpus is showing us the reduction reaction. So this is in terms of the material that was produced at 5 milliliter. Now this is uh, the charge discharge corpus obtained for the different um, for the for the coatings that were produced at different angle deposition pressure. So for example, in the figure A, the one that goes from 10 to 25 millitor, if we read the specific capacity reached by those coatings, it is in the order of 0.05 milliampere hour per gram. This value it is too small in comparison with the one that was obtained at five five millitor. So it is telling us this this um, charge charge course that the sample that was produced at five millitor it can store larger energy than the than the rest of the samples. So in order to understand why they had a really bad performance and that one had a better performance the surface of every of each one of the coatings, it was analyzed by X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. In order to to look at chemistry with each one of the coatings. So this is the general survey obtained from the sample produced at five millimeter. From this from this general survey, we can see the the, the signal coming from different uh, elements from the coating surface. For example, we have the iron signal, oxygen signal, phosphor signal, and of course the one in green, the, the lithium signal. These four signals are telling us that we, that we are close, well, they are related to the chemical formula of the lithium iron, iron phosphate. So this is a good news that we have that, that we have the presence of these uh, elements in the coating. We must observe some carbon impurities. They are related to absorbates. It is normal to have these carbon impurities. And also it was found the presence of aluminum because that comes from the substrate. So from the peak area of each one of the, of the elements, it was estimated the, um, the chemical concentration of each one of the elements. However, we didn't do the estimation concentration because um, because in this case the lithium signal is overlapping with the iron iron 3P signal. And because they are overlapping it is difficult for the system uh, to really um, give you a, a real value. So as I mentioned, every coating was analyzed using the XPS. So here we can see the iron signal for each one of the coatings. The oxygen, the, the, the oxygen peak for each one of the coatings, and the phosphor peak for each one of the coatings. If we put attention, and if we observe, every peak has its own intensity, its own white, and its own peak area. It is telling us that there is a chemical variation between between sample and sample. So the the good news it is that the XPS it can do some quantification and it can tell us how much iron, oxygen, and phosphor there is in the, in, in, the, in the surface of the coating. So after the quantification, we obtain this graph. The x-axis, it is placed the different samples that were analyzed, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30 milliliter. The y-axis, it is, it is presented, the atomic percentage of the elements. Which elements? Iron, represented in a square, oxygen, those red circles, and phosphorus for those blue triangles. So, they are Based on the, on the chemical formula of the lithium ion phosphate, what is the ideal value that we are looking for? So, we are looking for an iron um, atomic concentration of 10% and 
and the same the same value is true for phosphor. So having said that, I just drew a dotted line, which it is telling us that we should be close to this ideal value. In the case of the oxygen, it should be around 70%. Therefore, it was placed at this dotted line. So the red circles, they should be closer to these values, to be closer to the stoichiometry. From a quick analysis, the sample at 5 millitor, this one, highlighted in blue, it is, it is the sample that has, it has the right chemistry of the lithium iron phosphate. It has like 11% in iron, 10% in phosphor, and 71% in oxygen. The rest of the samples, 10 to 30 millitor, we observed that the iron, it was above the ideal value. Therefore, we have iron in excess. And regarding phosphor, it was below the ideal value, telling us that there is a phosphor deficiency. The case of the oxygen, it was observed that this value is decreasing as we are increasing the iron deposition pressure. So, in summary, so the cathode materials, the one placed at 5 millitor, it got the right chemical stoichiometry. The, the samples produced from 10 to 25 millitor, they were non stoichiometry, they got phosphor deficiency and iron in excess. The sample at 30 millitor, it was also non stoichiometry because it got um, an excess in iron and also a small deficiency in phosphor. So here it is observed a recovery of the phosphor content. That is something that needs to be explained. So this question, why did coating stoichiometry change drastically as the iron deposition pressure was varied? So to respond to this question, we need to assume three facts. The fact number one, well, we need to know three points and two facts. So, the, we need to know the sputtering yield of the, of the elements that are presented in the lithium iron phosphate target. What is the sputtering yield? The sputtering yield it is the total number of ejected atoms of one element once the, the target it is bombarded by, by one uh, by one atom of iron. Let me put that in example. Iron. Iron has an spotting yield equal to one. What is the meaning of that? That every time the target it is bombarded with iron, there will be an iron, one atom of iron injected from the target. In case of the phosphor, it has a different spotting yield. It is equal to three. What is the meaning of that? Every time that it is bombarded by one argon atom, there will be three phosphor atoms ejected from the surface of the target. The fact that we have to assume it is that in the sputtering there is the possibility of the generation of this. What is that? We have this material, lithium iron phosphate target. The nature of this material it is an atom. It is an oxide, therefore this is a source of a lot of oxygen atoms. Then, when we have the deposition, there is the, the ejection of oxygen atoms. Those oxygen atoms, they will enter into the discharge plasma, and inside of the discharge plasma, they will interact with the species that are inside. There are some electrons. Once they interact, with electrons, they will change its neutral nature to a negative nature. So now we have the formation of negative oxygen atoms. And finally, we need to assume that there is a possibility of having the restructuring effect. So what is that? So this is a schematic of the growth of the thin field that it is growing in the deposition. So those negative species, they have enough energy to bombard the, the film surface and therefore cause the ejection of the atoms of the film. 
And this is something that we don't want it in the deposition because what we want to do it is to grow a field, not to um, not to destroy a field. So by considering these three points, we can understand what happened with the chemical variation of the elements as we evaluate the argon deposition. So when we increase the argon deposition pressure based on this table, it was observed a lower oxygen content. So how to explain this? So, so this is the diagram when we have a low argon deposition pressure. When we have low argon deposition pressure, there is low concentration of argon atoms. Therefore, there will be low ejection of oxygen atoms. They will not have a lot of interaction. So there will be just a small concentration of oxygen negative species. They, they, they are so enough, they are, they are small enough that they will not affect the coating. However, as we increase the mid, the argon deposition pressure, there will be more argon, there will be more oxygen atoms, therefore there will be more collisions, they will interact more, and therefore there will be the formation of more oxygen, um, negative oxygen atoms. In this case, those negative oxygen atoms, they will not contribute with the chemistry of the coating. For that reason, we observe this decrease of the oxygen content. So, larger oxygen uh, argon deposition pressure, it will result in more that will not add into the coating chemistry. So, in this table, it is telling us that, that for the sample that goes from 10 to 30 milliliter, there is an excess in iron, and for the, for the same samples, there is a deficiency in phosphor. But at the end, for the The, the stichiometry of the lithium iron phosphate. A medium deposition pressure, the oxygen negative atoms, they will do the respattering of the field. If we follow the sputtering gel, the, the element that will be less affected it is iron. So it will be only one iron um, ejected from the target. But this is the because it has higher spot energy, it will be more affected. So every time that we have one oxygen atom coming to the surface, there will be several phosphor atoms ejected from the film surface. For that reason, we got an excess in iron and a deficiency in phosphor. So finally, why at 30 milliliter we got the recovery of phosphor? And that is because when at high concentration, there is high oxygen negative particles, they are interacting among each other, between each interaction they are reducing their energy, therefore they don't have enough energy to cause the ejection of phosphor. So, those are the hypotheses proposed in this research work related to the chemical compounds. So, now coming back to the charge discharge curves, we know Know that the samples from 10 to 25, they got really a small specific capacity. It is smaller than the one at, at 5 milliliter. Why? Because they were non stichiometry They got excess in iron and phosphor. They got a deficiency in phosphor. In the case of the 5 milliliter, that was stichiometry. So. We are almost at the end, so we took two batteries. Only one that got the stechiometry, 5 milliliter, and one which is non stechiometry. We assembled these two batteries, we evaluated these two batteries, and now we study the, um, the lifetime 
the aside tube get the fatty test of these two batteries. So for that, we run, we charge the battery, we discharge the battery, we repeated this cycle 50 times, so every cycle it lasted 2 hours, so in total every uh, fatigue test lasted 100 hours. Those were the results that we obtained. The panel on top, that corresponds to 30 mm, and in the first cycle we got a specific capacity of 3.2, in the cycle number 50 only 2.2. What happened, we got a 30% of the reduction of the specific capacity. The sample at 5 millilitre, we got in the first cycle 30, 50 cycle 30. We got 0% of reduction. What is telling us, the non stoichiometric battery uh, cathode, it gives us a non-stable battery. The stoichiometry cathode, it gives us a stable battery. So finally, we just run a small failure analysis on these two batteries, the stoichiometry and non stoichiometry battery. We evaluated um, this failure analysis using the, the potential cell. From here, we use the impedance spectroscopy in order to obtain this Nyquist, uh, this Nyquist plots. Those were the Nyquist plots that we obtained for the stoichiometry sample and non stoichiometry sample. The experimental data of this uh, Nyquist plot, it was fitted with these circuit elements, and let's see how to do the interpretation of the Nyquist plot. So the first section of the Nyquist plot, it is, if we follow just the dotted line, it is related to the electrical resistance of the electrolyte of the battery. The second section, it is related to the electrical conductivity at the surface of the cathode. And finally, the last section it is related to the ion diffusivity inside of the cathode. So now let's see what happened between the stoichiometry and non-stoichiometry um, samples. So starting with the, the analysis of the electrolyte. So between both the one at 5 millimeter and 30 millimeter. So both, in both cases, we obtain a similar electrical resistance. Why? Because we use the same electrolyte for that reason. And after we analyze the second, sex, the second section of the Nyquist plot, so basically this, this circle, for 5 minutes, we obtain an electrical resistance on the surface of 2,000 ohms. And for the one at 30 millitons, we obtain an electrical resistance of 80,000 ohms. What it is telling us that the stoichiometry sample it was it has a better electrical conductivity on the surface, and, and when, in terms of battery application, you want something with high electrical conductivity because it will allow the fast transfer the, the fast transfer process of the lithium of the lithium cations from the electrolyte to inside of the cathode. Finally, we analyze the last section of the of the of the Nyquist plot. From here, we determine how fast the lithium ion uh, moves inside of the cathode. We got this value 10 to the minus 16 per centimeter per second for the sample at 5 millimeter and the one at 30 millimeter. It was it presented um, a lower ion diffusion. So this is another this is another parameter that told us why the sample of five millimeter reached high specific energy capacity because the lithium ion diffusion the lithium ion it moves faster inside of this cathode. So sorry for taking so much time. Conclusion in this short work, it was producing lithium ion phosphate by radio frequency magnetron sputtering. We use this parameter, uh, 2.5 watts per square centimeter, the small amount of position pressure, high crystallization temperature of 500 degrees Celsius, and we obtain this kind of battery cells, and they, they show an stable performance.
And thanks for your attention. If you have a question, you can post it in, in English or in Spanish, it's fine. Okay? Thanks. Fabián, cuando hablas de las concentraciones que tenemos en el material para las baterías, dan unos pequeñísimos. ¿Cómo están medidos? ¿Qué significa es la que tenemos, la que tenemos o cómo está medido eso? ¿Y ¿En qué está medido? Este... Una de las primeras. ¿Y las concentraciones de, de la voz? ¿Qué me parece? Pues el material que tenemos o que estamos aquí. Sí, bueno, básicamente el tema es de concentración de... ¿Cómo está medido? Porque las números no tienen unidades, a lo menos 5 o a lo menos 3, es pequeñísimo. Ah, ah, ok. Bien al principio. Sí, 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 sí. Ah, sí. ¿Están estos? Pues no. ¿Te vas poniendo los pantalones? Sí. A ver. Bueno, es estos valores que no tienen unidad, ¿sabes? Este, son básicamente es una forma como de, de demostrar la concentración de este de, de, de ciertos elementos en el planeta, entonces yo pienso que por practicidad aquí este de este artículo decidieron no usar estas unidades y nada más ponernos valores que nos, nos, nos pueden decir cuánto hay de un elemento y cuánto hay de otro elemento este, de hecho esto se, se obtiene de una tabla periódica y en la tabla periódica ahí te dice que te da estos valores de cuánto hay de ese material en la planeta. Entonces esos valores ya me acuerdo que vienen de la tabla. Y es un siente. Sí, sí, exacto. De hecho es una, una proporción como, como comenta. Es la fracción de ese material en el planeta. Y, y como les comento, o sea, eso se encuentra en la, en la tabla periódica de cualquier este material. ¿Compararon o comparaste la eficiencia de las baterías, digamos, con estas que están haciendo? ¿Cuál es la... ¿Cuál es el, o, o algo por el estilo? ¿O por qué hacer estas baterías? O sea, nos dijiste, pues bueno, son tóxicas, eh, hay más material para hacerlas, pero en términos de eficiencia, si uh -huh. son mejores o... Así que nos están haciendo ahora. Ahorita estas baterías que se están produciendo aquí en el CIO, aún estamos en una... Como ven, estamos haciendo la optimización de los parámetros. Ahorita nosotros empezamos con el material, este, vamos a llamarlo o sea, no tiene nada de... no se está agregando nada nuevo, entonces los valores que nosotros estamos midiendo es lo que está ahorita reportado en literatura. Esta difusión de, de litio dentro de este material que es la que ya se reporta en literatura. Nosotros obtuvimos un valor similar. Ahora, ya a nivel comercial, esta debe de ser a la menos 14, entonces menos 13. Entonces, la, la siguiente fase de este proyecto es combinar este material con otros materiales que puedan aumentar su conductividad eléctrica. Otra vez, a través de esos depósitos de evaporación física. Entonces ya aquí hablamos de una codeposición, dos materiales al mismo tiempo y, y, y estamos en esa parte apenas.
de, de los tratos. Entonces, eh, a mí no me quedó claro eh, cómo previenes que se forme. Sí, este, básicamente en los actuales procesos de manufactura de electrodos que se ocupan en la industria, este es, este es básicamente parte de un proceso de, de solución, de una solución química. Entonces, como parte de una solución, tienes polvos que con una alta humedad, a la hora de secarse se desforman estas grietas. En el caso del espate, que tiene el crecimiento de películas de heladas a partir de, de, la, constru de, de la construcción de, de, de átomos sobre átomo, evitas la formación de estas grietas, a menos que decir, a menos que tengas un, a menos que, 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 que no tengas un control sobre el crecimiento del depósito, se da un y cuando, cuando es muy grueso, se empiezan a formar estas grietas. Pero por spattering es algo que casi no se presenta. Sin embargo, en depósitos por solución química es algo que normalmente se presenta porque cambia la humedad, ¿no? Durante el depósito. Que de igual forma me gustaría este, invitar a los estudiantes si alguien quiere participar en estos proyectos de baterías de litio. Este, pues hay espacio, hay material, este, ya vieron los equipos que están utilizando. Este, siempre está la invitación abierta por si alguien quiere participar en este proyecto, ya sea este, haciendo sus estudios de posgrado o en alguna estancia de investigación, si estamos abiertos. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas 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 gracias. Mu